Hello, and welcome to the Wheel of Crime podcast. This podcast is ran by two ladies who play games, mumble profanities, and laugh way too often. Also, this podcast does cover topics of sensitive nature, and as such, listener discretion is advised. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the Wheel of Crime podcast. My name is Jen. And my name is Emily. And yes, welcome back to another week. Um, Time does go on. Slowly. (laughs) It sure does. Slowly, yet quickly, and then slowly again. And that's just... That's how it is. Um, It be how it be, if you will. (laughs) It is of what it is. Um, Yeah, so... uh, Like a... (laughs) <laughs> listen i have a terrible brain fog today i like woke up and i was like i don't even know where i am but you know what it's fine um but no. is it because you were poisoned oh, well i mean amongst many other things that happened this last weekend uh, i won't get into details too too much for our listeners but uh just saying like people need to check their safety stuff at work otherwise you might accidentally end up poisoning many people <laughs> and making them very <laughs> sick for at least three days that's a real thing that could happen and that is not the vibe uh definitely not uh can attest to that uh would not do again um yeah and then uh <laughs> oh boy okay either way what did you do this last week jen we are recording this episode on valentine's day very romantic it's so romantic i'm spending the day with my one true love emily so obviously we're like soulmates totally 100 <laughs> percent. um <laughs> we're more like opposites attract i think oh yeah absolutely mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You're, you're much more serious than i am oh yeah that's it <laughs> um but yeah this weekend i did some date stuff with my partner because we just like had no ambition to go hustle and bustle out in the covid crowds today and then i Mm -hmm. worked and i played a little bit of animal crossing so it was pretty low key oh that sounds like so much fun um yeah uh (laughs) no that sounds like super chill so for like valentine's day my partner is allergic to the holidays but i think what i might do for today is i might just go pick us up some dinner later I tried to uh, shop for stuff over the weekend, but it's just, it gets tricky, I feel like, when you've already been with somebody for a long time. When things are still fresh, you can, like, put effort into, like, the romance and trying to get something they really like and, like, being novelty and all these other things. Whereas, like, I feel like at some point I just, I don't really know what to what to give anymore. I feel like um, he has a lot of socks <laughs> and, like, other things, and I'm, I'm not that creative. So, dinner it is. Dinner it is. Honestly, yeah, my partner and I, we just decided to forego gifts this year just because Valentine's Day is, like, one of those weird holidays where I'm just, like, I feel like we don't need to participate in capitalism today, but, um... That's kind of my thing, too. get some good eats, and I want flowers. Thank you. That's the thing. So, like, for myself, um, anyways, like, I did did a little bit of self-reflection, I feel like, during the pandemic about, like what I need to be doing as, like, an adult person for, like, you know, like, these types of things. Like, obviously, like, family or, or like, people-orientated uh, events, like, holidays, right? Um, and I feel like things like Christmas are probably something that you need to, like, you know, like, gifts are a thing or, like, birthdays. But then there's, like, the in-between holidays where, like, I don't really necessarily feel like I need to be getting people things for, like, say, like, Valentine's Day or, like, St. Patrick's Day or Easter or, like, Halloween. Like, if I really want to, I would. But... If there's not really an obligation for it. Yeah, I would I'm sorry, but I I never have and I never will buy anyone an Easter present <laughs> or a St. Patrick's <laughs> team. You're not gonna get me a <laughs> rabbit this year? I'm highly offended. You know how I feel <laughs> about bunnies. <laughs> Truly. See, I feel like birthdays, uh, Christmas, and then like Valentine's Day is the one kind of outlier where I'm like, it feels like it, it is like an opportunity oh, to yeah. give someone a gift, but I feel like it's more like heartfelt gifts or like experiences are like better for this holiday. Oh, yeah. Or like even like um just kind of like what we were talking about, like a date night, I feel like is very fitting for the holiday. Um, yeah. 100%. But, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. 
that's that's kind of like my my one my one two thoughts that I have about that and then uh and then like Jen alluded this last week um somebody wasn't doing what they were supposed to do and I ended up poisoned um <laughs> it's fine uh and then yeah um I'm trying to think if there was anything else that really happened this last week but other than working and just you know putting some time into into playing Pokemon uh that's basically it um I don't know. Now that I've played this game a little bit more, uh, I'm still very on the fence about it. It's like, it's definitely not one of my favorites, but it's fine. You know? Is it worth $80? Maybe to the right person. It's a, it's kind of hard because it's hard to know. What, is it worth $80 to you? Like, if you had known, like, this is how you were going to feel about it, would have you still purchased it? Probably not, like, when it first came out at full price. Like, I can understand why they're selling it the way that it is now. Um, but personally for me and my types of games that I like to play, um, if it's going to be RPG, I like having the full experience rather than just kind of like a half experience, which is kind of what I mm-hmm. feel like I got with this game. So it's more something I would, I would have waited, I think until there was like a sale where they like have it for like say 60 or something that I feel like might be a little bit more it. reasonable. It's only $20 less, but like, it's one of those things where... I, even though the game is a bit challenging in certain parts, even like for like a grown ass person like me, um, there are elements to it that still feel very childish. And then there was a lot of effort put into the Pokemon themselves and not so much into like the actual gameplay. It's like um, most of the, I feel like most of the efforts were put into like the story, uh, the Pokemon themselves, and then the, they just kind of missed the boat on like... Um, the environmental factors like you know like your town that you're in and like some other things it it makes more sense when you're playing it right but there are other people though who really like the simplicity of it for that reason because it is very predictable for certain things and then it's not like a true rpg there's boundaries where you can't go past certain boundaries so it's not really like it's a free exploration game you just have certain areas that you can go to um Mm. but yeah I that kind of got a little technical but um <laughs> but yeah no that's kind of how I how I've been feeling about it of course like because of who I am as a person I'm still playing it and all but I would say it's probably not one of my favorite ones fair enough I mean I have not played any Pokemon games so I have nothing to add but I understand <laughs> well no it's very hit or miss like sometimes like I'll I'll get a game where like I it's been recommended to me and I don't really know a whole lot about it and it just blows my mind like that's how I felt about um say, for example, Stardew Valley. It was something that was recommended to me and I kind of got into it. It was a little technical at first, but then once I kind of got into the job of things, like I ended up being obsessed with it for like, I think for sure about eight months. Like I was in there grinding at working at my farm every night and I loved it. It was fantastic. But like that, it's one of those things though where I didn't really know. And then like going into it, I was like, oh, eh, eh, I don't know. Yeah, I see. I started Stardew Valley. I think at the a bad time because I was super slammed with work, and then I just like was like, I don't know, like about this. I don't understand what I'm doing. I kind of did the same thing when I first started playing. If I'm gonna be honest, what happened with me? I don't even remember when I first started trying to play it, but I remember I picked it up once, and then I was like, oh, it's like there's a lot to do and I think this could be interesting but like with how like things are going right now like it's just it's too slow like my problem was is that I was like oh I don't really want to spend like eight hours like cutting down trees but then um I like put it down for a bit and then I re-came back to it like a few months later and restarted a file so that I just restarted from the beginning beginning and then I started playing it the way that I wanted to and that's when I got fell into my obsession Uh, then all of a sudden I was like fishing and I was doing all these other things that I really like to do I feel like I'm going to get to that point. Like, I, yeah, I don't know. I think eventually I'm going to repick it back up and become obsessed with it because it is the type of game that I like. So I'm like, I should really like like this. How do I make truffle oil? I'm going to make millions. (laughs) It's going to happen. I just don't know. It's a matter of when, not if. Yeah, right. I know. I have another game like that, too. It's like a... I bought Assassin's Creed, which, like, most people in my life have played and really like. And I know that it's one of those things where, like, I feel like if I put time into it, I'm going to get really highly obsessed. But I've only been, like, dipping my toes in every now and again. Like, I open up the file Mm. and I play a little bit and I'm like, ooh, let's let's pull that one back and revisit this in, like, a couple weeks. Like, (laughs) just because I know who I am as a person. But, um, yeah. I don't know, but that but that's the deal with that. I feel like as far as like new stuff in life, uh, a week is really not that long of a period of time. 
It's long enough to get poisoned. Uh, and it play goes Pokemon. by so. It goes by so fucking quick. Like honestly, and honestly, it like this week, this pa- like last week. Mm-hmm. Sorry, it's Monday today, but last <laughs> week felt so weird because we went to Edmonton over the weekend. And I got home on, we got home like really late Sunday night. And then Monday, Tuesday, like I didn't drink any alcohol or like have any substances of any kind. But like I felt fucking wrecked. Mm -hmm. I was just like so exhausted from the amount of social interaction. And we didn't even see that many people. But I I was just like exhausted. Mm -hmm. And so like all Monday, Tuesday, besides us recording, I did literally nothing. Oh yeah, just recharging. I actually have a theory. So, uh, just with that, because I I myself have had a couple times where I, like, go out to do things and then I just, like, I feel, like, just butchered the next day and I can't figure out what it is. I honestly think it depends. I think people, when they do certain activities, they pull from emotional energy and that ends up being what wrecks you because it doesn't make sense for certain things. Like, it's like visiting with people isn't something that's, like, physically exhausting, But then, like, depending on who it is, sometimes I wake up the next day and I feel like I just, like, finished, like, running a marathon, right? And I think it's just certain things pull certain amounts of emotional energy from you. And then that's all you need. And once you're out of emotional energy, it's, like, it's you just cop out. You can't do it. I know. God, I was just, I don't know, I was just fucking destroyed. And then Wednesday, I worked all day and then I had a friend come over to watch a movie. And then thursday friday i worked all day and then the weekend i did like work here and there but mostly just felt anxious that i hadn't gotten enough done this week so um yeah (laughs) and that checks out um yeah no i understand that one and uh yeah i don't know i don't know i don't know but we're back for another episode that's all i know right now um exactly so so let's spin our wheel of questions yes and uh I'll explain more once we're done our wheel of questions here. But this is going to be a very fun episode for me. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Okay. Uh, Number one. So, if your life was a play, would you be mad about it? Like, um, Like, say, for example, somebody was observing your life and they wrote, like, a musical or, like, a theatrical play about your life. Is that something where you'd be, like, bothered by it? Or would you be, like, flattered? Um, I think that really depends. <laughs> <laughs> On uh, what aspect of my life they're writing about and All how it. I'm Everything. Like, from the time you were conscious until today. I get, it's gonna depend on how I'm portrayed. If I'm portrayed as, like, that fucking... But end of the joke, I'm probably not going to be super <laughs> stoked about it. <laughs> I mean, fair enough. Yeah. But if they're like, ah, yes, Queen Jennifer. <laughs> Maybe I'll be stoked. I don't know. Okay. I didn't really I think, think about I would, that. I don't know if I would be like, at this point, I don't know if I would feel like one certain way. I mean, like, it, obviously it would depend on how they portrayed me. Mm-hmm. But... I think I would just feel, like, embarrassed. <laughs> if that makes sense, I'd be like, um, I have done literally nothing? Why? Okay, that's really funny. I, I understand, and also I did not think that deeply on this question when I wrote it, but you're totally right. That would be hella embarrassing, especially because, like, I'd be like, oh my god, like, you're just, like, airing out all my dirty laundry. <laughs> <laughs> Truly. <laughs> I'm like, I am not a person in the public eye, really, so what have I done to deserve this? (laughs) What embarrassing thing has gotten me this level of notoriety? Oh my god, like, in, like, a super sub-indie community, they're like, ah, yeah, Jen, like, have you seen the Jen musical? (laughs) Oh god, I would just cringe. I would want to die. I think what would make it worse is if, like, you wrote it yourself. (laughs) This is a musical about my I life. would never. Honestly, I have, like, a hard enough time just talking about things that I'm working on that have nothing to do with me. I could literally never write something about myself. I would <laughs> rather die. <laughs> I totally get it. That's like, um, I remember somebody like asked me Like, if I ever s- come up with a memoir, you know that it was a ghostwriter. Uh, either a ghostwriter right <laughs> or it's literally somebody who's pretending to be you. <laughs> that is it. It's- 
fake news. Honestly, yeah. I know. This like, audio might come back to bite me one day, but, like, I'm just saying I would never. Oh, yeah, right? And then watch you become, like, super famous, and then you're like, well, maybe. But no, um, see, my whole thing is somebody asked me once, they're like, oh, would you ever write, like, an autobiography? And I was like, literally about what? Literally about what? <laughs> and also, I don't want people to know me. <laughs> well, like, not, like, not want them to know me. But, like, uh, I feel like there's just, like, I feel like if somebody, like, knew my whole life story and they were like, oh, yeah, and then you did this for, like, this many years and I don't know who they are, I'd be like, hmm. Mm. <laughs> That's a little creepy, my friend. <laughs> I don't think I like that. I don't think you, I like it you either. You have thought too deeply about my existence and I'm not sure I'm comfortable with that. Um... But yeah, I don't know. See, these are all very good points. I did not think about that. Really, my thought when I wrote when I like wrote this question down was um I was like, I don't know. I feel like I would be like I would pr- I would be upset if it was just like a regular play. I would be more happy if it was a musical cuz I feel like musicals are a little usually a little bit more like light and like jaunty and fun. So, I was like, okay, I could settle for a musical cuz like um uh, Lay Miz, but it's just about you. <laughs> okay, maybe not that. <laughs> but like, um, <laughs> but no, it's like, so I was talking with my sister the other day because she was telling me about how um, the Glass Animals, they did an album where they like interviewed a bunch of people and then like wrote songs based off of these people's life stories, I guess. That's interesting. <laughs> and so I work with, so we work with fitness equipment, right? So I was like, oh man, like I wonder, <laughs> I wonder... What it would be like if somebody, like, wrote a song about, like, what we do for work. And so she, like, off the handle started singing a song about, like, working on treadmills. And it, like, deceased me. So then I was, like, writing these questions and I was, like, I can't even imagine if there was, like, a, a hit single number from a musical about my life about fucking treadmills. I think I'd die. I think that would be it for me. It would I'd be, be, like... Something like Emily picked up the barbell and then she <laughs> threw it around. <laughs> it, it would have to be a, a complete song. 180 in the air. Who knew she was this strong? <laughs> <laughs> yes, like so bad. I, I'm trying to remember what exactly she said. She she, she was like, uh, "Look at her now running on a treadmill." <laughs> <laughs> it was so bad. I was in tears. If I, was... I ever become a musician, I'm only gonna write songs about you working on fitness equipment. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> Worst album ever. I would hate it. I'd be. They'd be like, oh my god, are you it's... like Emily from like the fitness album? And I'd be like, mm. <laughs> that's me. <laughs> Maybe I am my besties muse. <laughs> <laughs> of course, always. Um. But yeah, no, uh, that that just reminded me of that, but too funny. That is too funny. Okay, I'm ready to move on to the next question. <laughs> <laughs> this is aging me like five years. Okay. <clears throat> what do you think of mischievous little guys? Oh god, is this about gremlins again? No. <laughs> the, the gremlins are from World War II. This is Valentine's Day. Oh god, is this some Valentine's Cupid shit? No. <laughs> but you have to answer. <laughs> what do you think of mischievous little guys? Uh, fucking men. <laughs> <laughs> I... Mm. <laughs> I have no idea how to answer this question. Um, <laughs> they exist, I'm sure, in exist. some capacity. Oh um, my gosh. Uh, they. Um, I have no idea. <laughs> uh, okay, so. Jen- I wish that they. You know, didn't fuck up World War Two with their gremlinness. <laughs> Mischievous little guys. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, what do I think about mischievous little guys? Uh, f- fun, I guess. Uh, out for a good time. Little bit of mischief here and there. It's Gucci. It's fresh. Um. 
And that's all I got to say about that one, because I don't want to spoil anything. So now we're on to our next question. Ah, okay. (laughs) Would you be friends with Shakespeare if you could? Probably. He seems fun, actually. Like, I'm not an expert on Shakespeare, obviously, because... Well, maybe not, obviously. I'm just not. Um... (laughs) (laughs) Everyone does hear, like, ah, damn, I thought she was a Shakespeare connoisseur. I'm so disappointed. I'm gonna stop listening to the podcast The world's leading expert in Shakespeare. Um... (laughs) (laughs) She had a PhD. In Shakespeare, yeah. Uh, Okay, but no, um... But from what I know, and just, like, I feel like you have to have a certain type of brain to write... The plays that he's written, I feel like he could be fun to hang out with, or at least like have wine with. I would, I would, I would have a conversation for sure. I don't know if I would be like friends, friends. That would be like depending on like, like what the vibes were. But I feel like the door's open for a conversation. Like a couple drinks and like feel it out, you know? Exactly. Like go to like a pub, like share a, share a frickle with each other. Maybe get something to drink. Just chat chat it out. Like put an hour or two into it, and then think about it later on. And be like, hmm, yeah, you know, it wasn't too bad. He's a pretty okay guy. Then go bowling and then, like, see how that goes. You know, is he too competitive? Is he just the right amount? Like, what's the vibe? Is he a sore loser? Is this a friendship that will last? Or, like, are we going to stay as acquaintances? (laughs) Did he pass the interview? Exactly. And then you got to invite him to, like, a party at your place. You can see, like, how he intermingles with, like, the rest of your friend group. You know, Mm -hmm. just, like, really feel it out. Oh, yeah. Like, how is the integration process going to go if we decide to move forward with this relationship? (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) It's like an interview. It is like an interview. Um, But, yeah. uh, And that's my answer. Well, what about you? Uh, Would you be friends with Shakespeare if you could? I mean, like, I wouldn't not be friends with him, but, like, I want, I would want to feel it out also, you know? Like, we gotta see if it's gonna work. I'm not gonna force anything. Oh, yeah, of course. Like, I'm not just gonna show up and be like, hey, Shakes, what's shaking? <laughs> Let's go get something <laughs> hey, to Shakes, drink. Hey, what's shaking? <laughs> How's the spear? <laughs> How's the spear? But, like, I, I get it, I get it. And this is also, like... Assuming that he's still alive today, I don't think I could be friends with a skeleton. Just saying. I don't care how cool they are. Hey, don't discriminate against skeletons. They could be cool, too. I was gonna make some kind of skeleton joke, but nothing came to mind. Throw me a bone here. (laughs) 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 Okay. Uh, (laughs) Sorry, I'm such a loser. Um, But... Yeah, I don't know. I feel like I feel like that's pretty much it for what I have to share about Shakespeare. Um, and that means we're on our last question. You ready? So ready. Cool. So, are you more of like a Robin Hood or a sheriff of Nottingham most days? In what regard? <laughs> in just i mean i wear a lot of like leggings which is more tight so that's robin hood-esque i suppose uh in any way you want to take it i guess see i feel like if i read this question i would take it as like um do i usually like in my life and with the people i spend time with am i more of like the like like, go-getter, like, vigilante-type person, or am I the person who kind of, like, is, like, a little bit more reserved and, like, um, is trying to arrest people? I don't know. I'm, I'm gonna be honest. When I wrote these questions, I, th- I was in a bit of a silly, goofy mood. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not a cop, so I'll go with Robin Hood. <laughs> You're like, well, I mean, g- career-speaking... Not a policeman. <laughs> I did not attend police academy, so I guess I'm Robin Hood. Okay. I feel like if I'm just like, a- <laughs> if I'm going off the vibes, I feel like uh, as a person, I feel more like Sheriff of Nottingham most days. But uh, I feel like reflectively, other people probably see me as more of a Robin Hood if we're just going based off of the amount of legging that I wear. Um... Mm-hmm. Visually, Robin Hood. Spiritually, Sheriff of Nottingham is what I'm going to go with. Career-wise, you're also not a cop, so no. I'll just point that out. Yeah, career-wise, I would also have to be a Robin Hood then. That would just have to be how it is. <laughs> I mean, he does like a lot of jumping around and stuff, so I think that fits in with your whole fitness thing you got going, so... Yeah, that would be a part of it for sure, yeah. You know what? I'll take it. 
Um, <laughs> I feel like... See, your partner Andrew is the other guy. The sheriff of Nottingham? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell him. Um, but, okay, so based off of my questions for you today, can you uh, figure out what my story is for you today? <laughs> <laughs> I... Uh, feel like some sort of love gremlin type things are in a Shakespeare play about Robin Hood or Robin Hood or one of them is a Robin Hood and is like stealing from the play in order to feed their family. (laughs) (laughs) Something obscure. You're actually very close. Cupid, maybe. Not that. I've done, I think I did Cupid last year. Um, but, uh, You are very close, though. So, um, I'm just going to go ahead with my description and then I'll kind of elaborate a little bit afterwards. Um, so, A Midsummer Night's Dream is a comedy written by William Shakespeare in the year 1595 or 1596. So, this play is set in Athens and consists of several subplots that revolve around the marriage of Theseus and Hippolyta. One subplot involves a conflict among four Athian lovers. Another follows a group of six amateur actors rehearsing the play which they are to perform before the wedding. Both groups find themselves in a forest inhabited by fairies who manipulate the humans and are engaged in their own domestic intrigue. This play is one of Shakespeare's most popular and is very widely performed. See, we saw this play together in London at at Shakespeare's Globe. But honestly, can't remember the plot at all because I was too distracted by the the child literally eating popcorn off the dirt floor. Well, the child was also, I feel like, eating gravel rather than popcorn half the time. So, I mean, that was the true performance happening at the time. Um, (laughs) But but yes, so (laughs) this is uh, my Valentine's Day one this year because I was inspired off of uh, Jenny and I's book series that we've been reading which is about fairies so i decided to find a very popular fairy from classical literature that everybody knows about or at least most people do i feel like it's it's used in a lot of like things i'll get into it um and that would be my my little my little teeny theme valence valentine's day Ooh. yes how romantic. Very. Is Resend the fairy? No, but I wish. <laughs> <laughs> Too funny. So, to bone or not to bone, that is the question. Um, but no, this is not about <laughs> reason. But I feel like you're going to know who it is once I start talking about him. Or of them, I guess. It's kind of... We'll see. But, um, yeah. Uh, should I just jump right into it then? Yes, jump on in. Okay, and then you'll have to let me know if you've heard this ca- of this character before. It's like I said, there's a Sh- Shakespeare's the root depiction, but this character comes up a lot in like history. So we'll just get into it. Okay, <clears throat> so one of the most popular characters in English folklore of the last thousand years has been the fairy, goblin, devil, or imp known by the name of Puck, or Robin Goodfellow. So the Wel- the Welsh call him Pwaka, or which is pronounced the same as his Irish incarnation, um, which I'm kind of going off of how it's spelled for the most part with this one. I tried to listen to pronunciations, with it, but they all kind of came up the same, even though they're different languages. But um, so right. how the Welsh one is spelled is P-W-C-A, which is Pwaka. Um, and then his Irish incarnation, which is, it's like Puka, but P-H. So with being English, it kind of reads as like Fuka. And then the other ones are Puka or Pukka. And so these are far from being his only names. So before I kind of get more into the origin of this character, um, Puck and how he relates to Shakespeare, since I use the Shakespeare description for him, um, is he is, uh... So Puck is one of the characters in uh, a mid or yeah Midsummer Night's Dream, um, which is the Shakespearean play, and he's known to be a trickster. So he is one of the fairy people who lives in the same kingdom as the fairy people, um, but his whole deal mm-hmm. is that he likes to play tricks on people, and he's just he's a bit mischievous, and he's pretty known for causing trouble. Right. So that's how he came, comes from like um, 
um, from the Shakespeare side of things. So this is kind of the additional parts to it, kind of to kind of like how this all connects to how we know this particular character today. So um, just a bit of background there. So indeed, Puck was a typical medieval term for the devil. So Puck also at some point was also uh, translated to being literally the devil. He's always here. Because he had to show up. He's always here, and we love him for that. Um, so <laughs> We do. <laughs> so, uh, for example, Langland once called Hell's, once called Hell Pook's Pinfold, and the Puka was sometimes pictured as a frightening creature with the head of an ass, so a donkey head. Um, truly a devil to behold. The Welsh Puka also did not match our modern conception of dainty Tinkerbell fairies, which is kind of how we see fairies today. Um, and according to Louise Imogen uh, Guinea, a peasant drew the puka as a queer little creature, long and grotesque, and looked something like a chicken half out of its shell. Which doesn't sound very cute or handsome. It does not. That sounds a little frightening. Um, I am afraid and um, no further questions. At this time. <laughs> You're like, I am frightened uh, down to my bones. Um, please continue. <laughs> <laughs> so as a shapeshifter, Puck has had many appearances over the years. He's been in the forms of animals, like how the puka can also become a horse, an eagle, or an ass, a.k.a. donkey. Um, cause I feel like every time I say somebody's becoming an ass, I just like, I have this particular image in my head of somebody who drives a truck and just genuinely behaves like an asshole. Um, but in this case, I mean a donkey. <laughs> I don't mean your local Chad. <laughs> we don't mean your giant butt. No, not that either. So, uh, he's been a rough, hairy creature in many versions. Um, one story has him depicted as an old man. He's also been pictured like a brownie or a hobbit. And in 1785, in a painting by William Blake, he looks like Pan from Greek mythology. And in 1841 painting by Richard Dad, uh, Puck looks like an innocent child. And in a modern cartoon show, uh, and a modern cartoon show portrays him as a silver-haired elf. Um, so the modern cartoon show is uh, Gargoyles. Did you ever watch Gargoyles? Um. I didn't really watch it as a kid, but I definitely, like, saw, have seen, like, clips. And I think I've probably seen an episode or two, but, like, nothing consistent. Were, did, were you a watcher of that show? I wasn't, but um, when I was older, uh, my partner and I, we kind of went through a phase for a while where we watched, like, um, like more, like, not, like, classic, classic cartoons, but things that were, like, popular in, like, the 80s, or not the 80s, but, like, 90s especially, or, like, early 2000s. And Gargoyles was one of them, and uh, Puck is one of the characters in the show, and they do call him Puck in the show, and he is a silver-haired, like, pointy-eared elf person, and I believe he's a villain, if I'm remembering correctly, but that would be one of his modern depictions. Yeah, I only really remember, like, the gargoyles from that show, because they were, like, stone and sitting on top of, like, a giant building and being, like... Yeah, you know, and just being really cool in general. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, future career path for me. That's my eventual goal. Um, <laughs> same life aspiration unlocked. Yeah, right. Just I get to be outside all day and like just sit there and do nothing. Sign me up. Um, so eh, moving on. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> Puck uses his shape shifting uh, abilities to make mischief. For example, the Puka would turn into a horse and lead people on a wild ride, sometimes dumping them into water. And the Welsh Puka would lead travels with a lantern and then blow it out when they were at the edge of a cliff being misled by a puck sometimes the legends speak of pucks pukas and robin goodfellows in plural um and they were known in the middlelands as being puk leden and that's a lot like the fra the phrase pixie led which describes a similar action on the part of somerset fairies known as pixies so some believe that the term pixie is derived from puck Yet another expression for being lost is Robin Goodfellow has been with you tonight. And there's a reference to this in it, it uh, to this at, uh, blah, blah, blah. there's a reference to this at least as early as 1531. So you're going to hear this name Robin Goodfellow come up a few times. It'll make sense in a bit, but that's uh, Robin Goodfellow and Puck have both been like really old terms that have kind of like continued to travel through the years. And for a while they meant the same thing, 
but they don't really mean the same thing anymore, um, which I'll get into. Copy that. Yes. So, um, Robin Goodfellow is one of the fairies known as Hobgoblins or just Hobbs. Hob is short for the name Robin or Robert. So the goblin named Robin would be... (laughs) <laughs> would be it. So, uh, Robin itself was a medieval nickname for the devil as well. <laughs> well, sorry, I just need to back up to the <laughs> goblin named Robin. Robin the goblin. <laughs> That's me. You're Robin That's the goblin? How they describe me. Oh my god, it's so nice yeah. to meet you, Robin the goblin. <laughs> I've I've heard about your work for years. And you're uh Gerda the Gremlin. Gerda the Gremlin! <laughs> no, I'm I'm uh Puka the Ass. You're Robin the Goblin, I'm Puka the Yes. This is why we're soulmates. Obviously, it's like a match made in hell because uh, we're both the devil in this situation. <laughs> the devil, he's here again. He's here, once to again. See us both. Of course. When, when is he not? It's us. It's us. <laughs> so, uh, yes, yeah, so a goblin named Robin, uh, and Robin itself was a medieval name for the devil. So, um, Robin Goodfellow was not only famous for shape-shifting and misleading travelers, but he was also known as a helpful domestic sprite, very similar to brownies. So brownies, um, just because I know you're not, like, super into mythology, really, at all, except for what I've told you, um, brownies are kind of, like, supposed to be these little, like, um, goblin-like creatures that are very hairy and very small, and they live in your house, and they're supposed to basically, like, help you with things in exchange for, like, stuff so they'll like take things from you like like things you don't use or like food or whatever and then in return they do things for you like like guard your house yeah I have or... one of those in my house yeah right <laughs> his name is Jonathan he's actually not very small he's much taller than me but <laughs> but I do feed him <laughs> I do feed him that's true right you also have one I do um he's also taller than me and uh, I try to feed him but he does not want to do that um, <laughs> too funny. He would rather eat lentils all day, every day. So brownies, not like the food. Um, he would clean houses and such in exchange for cream or milk. So if offered new clothes, he would stop cleaning. And there are stories of the puka or pukwa doing the similar deeds. And there's a record for a Robin Goodfellow ballad in 1588. And a little less than a decade later... William Shakespeare gave his puck the name and nature of a more benevolent Robin Goodfellow. So basically, Robin Goodfellow has been a term for a really, really long time, as well as puck. But when uh, Shakespeare wrote his play, he basically melded the two together. So he took the stories of the puck or the po- or the puka uh, from mythology. And then took the Robin Goodfellow kind of, like, um, ideology. Because for some people in some cultures, it was a real thing. Like, a, an actual creature or character or um, cryptid, I guess. Whereas for some people, it was more of, like, a phrase. So he took the two and melded them together and instead named it Puck, officially. And then uh, gave the character the personality and like the better traits of a robin goodfellow okay i see but they're supposed to be similar now or at least the same thing so that's what the play did is it melded those two ideas together um yeah so uh however shakespeare's puck is more closely tied to the fairy courts than most pucks or robin goodfellows so what that means is that um in like historically speaking when it comes to mythology um so the fairy world is supposed to be different and kind of its own thing compared to other creatures from mythology. So at this time, a Robin Goodfellow or a Puck or a Puka or like, cause those were all kind of, they're similar, but different, um, were considered more to be like creatures or cryptids or monsters, or just, they're kind of like their own thing and they're on the outside. Whereas like with the Mm -hmm. fairies, the fairies are supposed to have their own world. So they don't really belong with us. It's like almost like they're on a different plane of existence and they can kind of cross between. So. So it's like Akatar. It's very similar in that way. And that's kind of where that idea comes from with like modern day depictions of fairies. They kept the whole realm thing separately. Whereas like, um, basically how we view Bigfoot, it would be very similar to how they viewed the puka or um or robin goodfellows you know i see okay 
So, like, there's people out there, like, being like, I know where this puck guy is and yeah. I'm gonna find they, him. They were like, yeah, I saw, like, uh, a puka outside the other day. Like, it, it would be, like, stuff like that versus, like, if you saw a fairy, it would be more of a situation where a lot of people viewed very, like, fairies are more tied into paganism as well. It's, like, a whole thing. But they're just very different and it's more of, like, um, if somebody ran into a fairy, it was more of, like, a, like a, you stepped into an alternate universe kind of thing. Um, or you're, like, not of this realm anymore. Whereas, like, you could, like, walk outside and potentially see a puka. Is kind of how I read into it. Okay, I see. Yep. So here's a long quotation from A Midsummer Night's Dream. It's from a meeting between Puck and one of Titiana's fairies. So, uh, just to briefly, um, so in A Midsummer Night's Dream, one of the two main characters are the leaders or the royalty of the fairy kingdom. And that is King Oberian and Queen Titiana. And so there's a few, uh, or Titiana, Titiana? I'm not really sure how the pronunciation is. Um, but they're one of the bigger members of this play, so they're pretty well known, as well as Puck and some other people. Um, but this quotation is between Puck and one of the Queen's fairies, and it sums up Robin Goodfellow's nature pretty well. So uh, I'm going to send you a script that you're going to have to read out loud, and you're going to speak from the... Uh, the um position of the fairy and i will answer back as puck all righty we're going we're getting interactive today we sure are <laughs> i thought we'd do something extra fun for valentine's day Ooh. so you're meant to go first so you can just start whenever you receive it okay okay either i make your shape and making quite or else you are a shrewd and navish sprite called robin goodfellow are you not he that frights the maidens of the villagery, skim milk and sometimes labor in the quern, and bootless make the breathless housewife churn, and sometime make the drink to bear no barm, misled night wanders laughing at, n- laughing at their harm? Those that hobgoblin call you and sweet puck, do their work and they shall have good luck. And you not he? <clears throat> Thou speakest all right. I am that merry wanderer of the night. I jest to Oberian and make him smile when I a fat and bean-fed horse beguile, neighing in likeness of a filly foal, and sometime lurk I in the gossip's bowl, in very likeness of a roasted crab. And when she drinks, against her lips I bob, and on her withered dewlap pour the ale, the wisest aunt, telling the saddest tale, Sometime for three foot stool mistaketh me, then I slip I from her bum, down sh- topples she, and Taylor cries and falls into a cough, and then the whole choir holds their hips and laugh, and a waxen in their mirth, and knees and swear a merrier hour was never wasted there. And that is an excerpt from a Midsummer Night's Dream Act 2 scene I. I love Old English. <laughs> it's so fun. It's so much fun. I love reading it. And then, um, it's just... You saucy bootlickers. <laughs> you saucy bootlicker. I don't know. There's just something about it that's very, like, uh, it's just fun. It's like what you said. It's just very fun. Um, but yeah, so... Like... I think I'm going to call, like, from now on, whenever someone insults me, I'm going to be like, you shrewd and navish sprite. You <laughs> shrewd and navish sprite. Right? I know. Um, and it's funny, too, because it also, it really makes you think because you don't really understand really what's being spoken either. Like, the words themselves make sense. But then when they're put together, you're like, it's fun, but I don't know what it means. Um, but... <laughs> I think I understand what they're trying to say here, but like, yeah, it's definitely, you have to think about it mm, a little bit. Oh, for sure. Yep. Yeah, so basically with this excerpt, the, the, the purpose of including it is just that it means, um, it's basically he, they've taken, um, some of the more negative aspects of what a Robin Goodfellow is and made it, and like they said before, kind of like made it more benevolent, but he's still very like full of trickery and he really gets enjoyment out of like bringing people like minor amounts of suffering. It's just fun for him. Yeah. A hundred percent. You know, like I can relate. Yep. And just like 
just being a giant prankster. I, I feel like that's basically the whole point of his character is just to be a prankster. Um, and, and yeah, that, that that's just what that was meant to do is to show you a little bit of kind of like how he was portrayed in Shakespeare. Because that's kind of where a lot of this comes from, too. Um, to, to show us what his vibe is. Yeah, to give you a vibe. So, um, with that... Having Shakespeare as a publicist certainly did not hurt Puck or Robin Goodfellow's career. Prior Shakespeare, who may have been influenced by the Welsh Pucca, Puck, and Robin Goodfellow, were considered separate creatures. Now, after this point, they were considered the same. So, A Midsummer Night's Dream remains one of Shakespeare's most performed plays. Perfect for a forest-like setting, this classic is performed every summer in parks around the world. So, ironically... Reginald Scott wrote in 1584 that the belief in Robin Goodfellow was not as strong as it had been a century earlier. In fact, Robin was about to get some big breaks in Renaissance show business. So, Robin Goodfellow started to appear in more plays around 1600s, and there were many 17th century broadside ballets about him. So, in these ballads, Robin Goodfellow is the son of Oberian, the fairy king, and a mortal woman. So this is like taking a spin-off from from the play now, right? Um, right. So he pulls pranks, shapeshifts into various animals, and the foolish fire known as the Will of the Wisps gets into trouble and does the kind of thing that's uh, often described in Shakespeare's play. So Robin's trademark laugh is ho ho ho, and one 1628 ballad song may uh, may have been written by Shakespeare's drinking buddy, the great Jacobite or Jacobine. That's how they have it written, but I'm pretty sure it's that. In the reign of James I, the king after Elizabeth I, playwright Ben Johnson. And Ben Johnson certainly knew his tricksters. The Puck Harry, or Robin Goodfellow, is a character in his unfinished Robin Hood play, The Sad Shepherd. So, there may be a connection between Robin Hood and Robin Goodfellow. So, many pagans believe Robin Hood was originally a fairy or pagan god. Um, that's kind of like a, it's a belief shared by some, but that doesn't, isn't like the most widespread belief on how this kind of derived into existence. Um, as, uh, there's very little magic in the earliest Robin Hood, uh, tales, but still the two Robins do have, uh, some things in common. So both have a penchant for giving travelers a hard time. Puck was a shapeshifter and Robin Hood is, uh, then after described as being a master of disguise. And uh, Gillian Edwards notes that Goodfellow and Robin Goodfellow's name could either mean a boon companion or a thief. So if you were one of Hood's archers and looked upon him as a boon companion, or the sheriff of Nottingham had pursued or pursued him as a thief, you might consider him equally well named a Robin Goodfellow. So, since the Robin Goodfellow ballads appeared later than the Robin Hood ones, it's possible that the fairy may have taken his name from the outlaw and not the other way around. So, basically, all that means is, like, around the time that this Robin Hood play it had kind of started to become a thing, the play itself wasn't called Robin Hood, it was called The Good Shepherd, but all of a sudden Robin Hood became a name and a character that was very, very similar to Robin Goodfellows. And nobody was really talking about Robin Goodfellows anymore. Because of Puck. So when Shakespeare wrote about Puck, he basically had taken the two myths, made them into one, and then people after that only would ever talk about, like, the Puck. Or the Puka. Right. So then, uh, nobody really talked about Robin Goodfellows. Or Robin Goodfellows. Right. So then, all of a sudden, um, Robin Hood appears, and people start, even though, um, Robin Goodfellow and Robin Hood were kind of intermingling at the same time... It's almost like they kind of morphed into the same character through retellings. Mm. Because by Robin Hood being a good fella, he then became Robin Goodfella. You know, it's kind of like a weird... It's like a linguistic thing that just happened. Yeah. And poor Robin Goodfella, you know, first he gets mistaken for Puck and now he's mistaken for Robin Hood. Well, and then at one point... Everyone forgot about him. They did. And at one point before Shakespeare, Robin Goodfellow was just a name for like a creature. There was there was allegedly several Robin Goodfellas. It wasn't just one person. And then after Shakespeare, it became one person. I wonder if he stars in the movie Goodfellas. We'll have to look into it. It's It's, it's possible. <laughs> <laughs> can confirm he doesn't but um he should in the sequel he, definitely that's that's just coming it's a long time coming get on that score says he 
Right. So, um, concerning him being a hobgoblin, or the hobbits, uh, and Harry, so, uh, Daw, so, here's the thing. So, Robin Goodfellow and Puck still are considered to some degree to be a hobgoblin, right? So, I kind of went over that in the beginning about how, like, visually they were either, like, a fairy or a hobgoblin or like a gremlin or like an imp or like there's just a lot of things that they're all supposed to be at the same time these are all different things but this is just how the interpretation goes so right one of the caricatures that kind of continued through time was him being a hobgoblin specifically so what that is it, it, the meaning changes a lot so i didn't really include it because it depends on when you're talking about it in like history and interpretations um mm -hmm. however so Hobgoblin, hobbits, derives from hobgoblin, and Harry. So, Dob, like Hob and Robin, is a short form of Robert. Okay? Okay. Are you following? I'm following. Dobby the house elf from J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter novels takes his name from hobgoblin-related legends as well. Another imposter. Yep. So, now you can tie in um, hobbits dobby to hobgoblins and you can tie hobgoblins to puck or pukas and robin goodfellow who is also robin hood there's a lot of uh connections it's like you know in those like crime shows where they've got like the murder board and like the strings yeah except for it's like me connecting you. dobby from like <laughs> from like uh <laughs> J from Harry Potter all the way over to like Robin Hood and I'm like yes makes sense luck <laughs> 100% it does basically that's what's happening right now right and so um exactly right and so if we're speaking of Hobbes and we're talking about J.R.R. Tolkien's most famous creation The Hobbits um undoubtedly the Bagginses the Gamgees the Tooks and the Brandy Bucks from Tolkien's 20th century novel and 21st century films uh, the Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings are can be considered distant cousins of the Hobgoblin based off of the derivation. From that, Puck, or Robin Goodfellow, has a long and colorful past, and judging from his recent appearances, he has a long and colorful future ahead of him as well. And so, to finish off my story for you today, I'm going to end with one last Puck quote. Are you ready? I'm so ready. All right, here we are. So, by Oak... Ash and thorn, cried Puck, taking off his blue cap. I like you too. Sprinkle plenty of salt on the biscuit, Dan, and I'll eat it with you. That'll show you the sort of person I am. Some of us, he went on, with his mouth full, couldn't abide salt or horseshoes over a door or mountain ash berries or running water or cold iron or the sound of church bells. But I'm Puck. And so that is Puck of Pook's Hill by Rudyard Kibling's quote. And that is the story of Puck, our favorite little fairy trickster from ye old days. Half of Valentine's Day. And how he robbed Robin Goodfella of a legacy. Of a legacy. And now we have Robin Hood, who has his own very interesting legacy himself. What a shame. Yep. But yeah, no, uh, that was basically that. And I do find it interesting how everything ties together. Obviously, because this is a very interesting topic for me. Um, <laughs> but yeah, well, that and I guess, uh, you know, retelling through history, it's interesting to see how things morph over time. It is. It's interesting how, like, especially the way back when history wasn't, like, as linear as it is today, mm -hmm. there was a lot more, like, bits taken from here and, like, things taken from there. Mm -hmm. And, like, people just kind of pulled from, like, whatever they heard and then things morphed into something else. Oh, yeah, for sure. And then that's the thing, too, is, like, uh, it's interesting for usually the type of stories that I cover, which, which are usually, like, you know, mythology or legends or, you know, stuff like that, um, because it'll you'll see something and it'll be so different from something else but usually the reason that it's so different is because one person would have told another person very basic details and then they just kind of left the rest up to imagination and it creates new creatures. So then all of a sudden we have recorded things in history that weren't ever recorded before because one person was talking to another person and either there was a miscommunication or they weren't very descriptive or it was just kind of left open to interpretation and then you end up with an entirely new mythological creature. Which is kind of neat. It is very neat. And then just kind of get passed down through history as being like a real deal thing. And then uh, 
And then you end up today where an, an imp, a goblin, a hobgoblin, a gremlin, all these things are supposed to be of the same, but yet they are very different in a lot of ways. I feel like they all kind of started from the same thing and then morphed into very different things now. Yep. I like to think that they're like region specific. <laughs> they're from different countries. <laughs> they have different cultural identities. Mm, yeah. So the, the gremlins are from Germany. Obviously. Uh, the pucks are from England. The pucks are from England, but the, but the pukas are from, they're, they're Welsh. See? Just different vibes. Different vibes all around. But yeah, so um, with that, that brings us to the end of our episode today. If you guys liked this episode and think that we're like super rad, um, you can leave us a review on pretty much anything now. Um, I saw that Spotify also did an update recently where you can leave us a show rating. So it'd be really cool if you could leave us a review there um, or anywhere. Uh, we don't care. We're open to interpretation. We just hope you like us. And then uh, if you would like to check us out more, we have a website as well, which is www.wheelcrime.com. Um, and if you would like to donate to the show, we have a Patreon. So that's at Wheel Crime on Patreon. And we do have rewards for the different tiers if you'd like to check that out, because that is pretty cool too. You can also check us out on our social media for any show updates, which is uh, Wheel of Crime on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. You can email us and just say anything you want, really. We're, we're pretty open. <laughs> which is uh, <laughs> www.wheelofcrime.com just with anything your own story um, have you seen a puka how has the devil visited you this last week were you poisoned were you poisoned I would love to know uh, <laughs> and with that that is the end of our episode for this week we will see you next week for another brand new episode of the podcast woo 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 okay bye Bye.